Eventually, when enough pressure builds up, something has to give. Let's think about where we've got to so far in the story of Israel. Mankind had turned away from God, but God had made a covenant with Abraham and his descendants that he would make them into a great nation. He would give them a land. All nations would be blessed through them. He's given them his law. He's given them his presence through the tabernacle and the temple. And God has declared that one of David's sons will reign on his throne forever. But the problem of Genesis 3 has not gone away. Humans are just as sinful as they have ever been. Israel was supposed to be a blessing to the other nations. Really, it is acting just like any other nation. And so Israel splits into two. You have the northern kingdom, Israel, and the southern kingdom, Judah, where Jerusalem was. But under the leadership of their kings, they turn away from God. The kings in the north are worried about their followers looking to Jerusalem, God's holy city in the south. And so they begin to import and encourage the worship of foreign gods. It leads them away from the worship of the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. Judah in the south is not much better. Although some of their kings seek to follow God, many do not. And so both Israel and Judah are warned by God what is going to happen. God sends his prophets to both kingdoms, men like Isaiah or Jeremiah and Ezekiel, telling them what he will do if they do not turn back to him. In Jeremiah 2, God explains clearly what the people are guilty of. My people have committed two sins. They have forsaken me, the spring of living water, and they have dug their own cisterns, broken cisterns that cannot hold water. So the people have turned away from the living God and they've put their trust in things made by man, whether that is in idolatrous worship or in the pursuit of power or in the pursuit of money. These things cannot save. They cannot hold water, God says. Ultimately, they have become like the other nations. Israel had been distinct in having God's law. God had given them his good wisdom on how to live. But now the prophets are warning that they have turned away from his law. They have forgotten the orphan and the poor and the foreigner and the widow. They are not living lives of justice. Their systems are beset by corruption and the powerful are exploiting the innocent. What does the Lord require of you? Micah asks. The answer is simple, to act justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. And they were distinct too in having a unique, special, intimate relationship with the living God, but they have now turned away from worshipping Yahweh. They have run after the foreign gods. Think of Jeroboam, who erects the golden calves for the people to bow down to, just as the Israelites had done with Aaron in the wilderness. Or think of Ahab, who marries Jezebel and brings in the worship of the god Baal until Elijah challenges him. When asked what the most important commandment was, Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength and love your neighbour as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. Well, love of God and love of neighbour, Israel has forgotten both. The people have turned away from God's law and are not loving their neighbour and they've turned away from worshipping the one true God. They're not loving him with all their heart. Israel had been supposed to be a light to the nations. Instead, both kingdoms had become just like all the other nations. And so just as God would judge the other nations, so he would bring judgment against his own people too. 
for three sins of Judah, even the four, I will not relent. Because they have rejected the law of the Lord and have not kept his decrees, because they have been led astray by false gods, the gods their ancestors followed, I will send fire on Judah that will consume the fortresses of Jerusalem. That is what God said. And he said something similar against Israel too. Sin matters to God. The way his own people treated one another and the way they treated him matter. God is a righteous judge. He laments over his people and what they've become, but his punishments will be just. Just as in Eden, where sin had to be judged, so it is with his people again. Eventually, when enough pressure builds up, something has to give. Israel is conquered by Assyria and destroyed in 722 BC. Judah limps on for another hundred years or so, but eventually Judah too is conquered by Babylon this time. And Jerusalem, God's holy city, is sacked. The temple, the sign of his presence, is burnt down. The inhabitants, God's chosen people, are taken off into exile in Babylon. Had God's promises failed? His covenants with Abraham and David, they seem to lie in ruins at this point. Have God's plans died? Well, no, that is not what the prophets foresaw. God's judgment was just, yes, but God would still keep his promises. God would bring them back from Babylon. God was still the God who saves. He would bring them back out of exile in a new exodus to the promised land. He would restore a king on David's throne. He would raise up a righteous branch. He would not forget or forsake his people forever. In fact, Jeremiah said that God would make a new covenant with them when he would write his law on their hearts. And the prophet's gaze widened to God's cosmic plan, and they saw a day when he would accomplish his plans for the whole world. Yes, the Gentiles, they would one day be blessed. One day they would recognise the one true God. And what was wrong would be put right. The conflict in creation, the curse of the fall, they would disappear. The wolf would lie down with the lamb. The sword would be beaten into the plowshare. God, one day, Isaiah said, will create a new heavens and a new earth. And he will wipe away every tear from our eyes. God would still accomplish his plans. And even when his people came back from exile and returned to Jerusalem, and things didn't initially seem to be as grand or as exciting as they'd hoped, they continued to trust that one day God would make all things new. There is always something inherently dissatisfying about a story left unfinished, or with a chord in a piece of music which is left unresolved. We ache for resolution, for all the threads in a story to somehow fit together and everything to work out the way it is supposed to. And the story of the Old Testament is ultimately a story left unfinished. It's a story in need of resolution. It's a story which is waiting for a king. The promised son of David, the anointed one, the Messiah, who will reign forever and ever. It's a story which is waiting for all the nations to be blessed, as God promised to Abraham. They wait for the good news. It's a story which waits for the gospel to go out to the Gentiles and for people from every tribe and tongue to turn to the God of Israel. And it's a story which is waiting for the curse of the fall to be reversed. For the seed of a woman, the serpent crusher, to come and defeat evil and atone for human sin. And to make a way that man might dwell with God again 
as he did in Eden, in a new heaven and a new earth, full of life and flourishing and harmony and goodness and abundance. It's a story which is waiting for a resolution. And when Jesus came, his very first words in Mark's gospel are these. The time has come. Because above all, this is a story which has been waiting for Jesus Christ. <laughs>